From the outside, John Parker's life in upscale Crown Point, Indiana appeared to be picture perfect. Married with kids, he and his wife Judy ran a very successful business selling Kirby vacuums, but appearances can be deceiving. On April 17, 2003, Judy called 911 to report that John had been shot outside their car. She told authorities she heard two gunshots and saw an unidentified figure in black ran from the scene. Little is known about the early life of John Parker. It's scarcely mentioned that he was born in 1970, had at least one sibling, and lived in Indiana, United States. He came from a middle-class family and was always an entrepreneurial young man with a desire for independence, self-improvement, and a hunger to take on the world. Therefore, it's not surprising that immediately after graduating from high school, he sought ways to earn money and, according to his brother, his first job was as a waiter's assistant in a restaurant, though he didn't last long there. For reasons unknown, John became angry at work and quit. However, this did not deter his ambitions, and sooner rather than later, he found a new job that not only allowed him more independence in his tasks, but also led him to discover his true calling sales. John began working as a door-to-door -door salesman for Kirby vacuum cleaners. Initially, his family mocked him, but in a short time, John proved to everyone that he had found his direction in life. In fact, by the end of his first year, he was practically the company's number one salesman in the area and announced he wouldn't settle for just that. Working long hours from 12 to 16 hours a day, he became not only a sales leader whose achievements were recognized at company meetings, but also a guide for other salespeople who found new ideas, inspiration, and a role model in him. It was during this time that he met 20-year-old Judy, a young girl who was born in October 1969 and lived in Texas in a low-income family of three children. She was very outgoing, and even though John was not looking to hire more salespeople at the time, Judy convinced him that she was the best in the sales field. Despite her young age, she was not a shy girl. In fact, she was a fully grown woman who, with her parents' consent, had married at 14 and was divorced with two children, Christina and Daniel Hicks, by the time she met John. John decided to give this determined applicant a chance and became her mentor in vacuum cleaner sales. Judy not only earned a place in the sales force led by John, but also won the heart of her boss, and some time later, they embarked on a romantic relationship. John's life could not have been better. He had a well-earned reputation as an excellent salesman and trainer, and also had Judy's support in life and work. With these foundations, he decided to start his own business in Michigan, becoming a sales and service operator for Kirby Vacuum Cleaners. He also offered training sessions for salespeople, passing on his personal secret and the enthusiasm that had made him a star in the sector. His company was recognized as one of the top in the area, and John always highlighted that he had achieved this success thanks to Judy's support. In 1992, with his professional life resolved, the couple got married, and in the following years, they dedicated themselves to demonstrating what a good salesperson could achieve in life. The couple had two daughters, Tiffany and Erica, bringing the number of children in the family to four. They moved residences several times, always to better locations, and the children began to enjoy the benefits earned through the hard work of John and Judy. Initially, he had no issues with his wife's children. 
Christina was a sweet little girl, and Daniel was somewhat hyperactive and mischievous. The Parkers enjoyed a good home, excellent schools for the children, high-end cars, and frequent vacations. John was amassing a significant fortune and didn't want to hide it. On the contrary, he used it as an incentive for the young salespeople he trained, showing them what could be achieved through hard work. However, as time passed and Judy's children entered their teenage years, problems began. Christina's choice of friends was terrible, as she chose those with the worst behavior and engaged in drinking with them. Allegedly, according to some sources, she also used drugs. Meanwhile, 13-year-old Daniel was not on a good path either and seemed to be angry and poorly accompanied all the time. On one occasion, while with a group of friends, Daniel took John's car and drove around the neighborhood, destroying many of the mailbox posts. The next day, John went from house to house paying the owners for the damage caused to prevent them from reporting the boy to the police. Around this time, John was also called to his stepson's school to receive a complaint about the boy's bad behavior. It appears that on this occasion, John ended up hitting the young man, which of course generated tension in the relationship. After nine years together, Judy finally took her family to Texas so they could see the humble place where she had grown up and meet one of her brothers who still lived there. During this trip, Judy complained to her brother that her marriage was failing and that John mistreated her children. The truth was that Judy, far from recognizing that her older children were on the wrong path, sided with them, which of course heated up what seemed to be a pressure cooker. If everything was already bad, things worsened when John began to suspect that his wife was being unfaithful with an employee of his company. True to his way of solving problems, John was not a man to sit and stew over a problem, but a man of action. To leave no room for doubt, he installed cameras in various parts of the office and finally obtained irrefutable proof that confirmed his suspicions. At that moment, John's world collapsed and his previously cheerful and cordial behavior took a 180 degree turn. He began to drink and under the influence of alcohol, he not only had terrible arguments with Judy, but also became rough towards his children. His daughter Tiffany received a beating with a belt when her teacher informed her father that she had not brought her homework to school. When the teacher saw the marks from the beating the next day, she called social services to report the incident. Before they arrived, John made it clear to the four kids that if they wanted to continue enjoying the luxurious life they had been living up to that moment, it was better to say nothing about the beating. Indeed, Tiffany blamed her stepbrother Daniel for what had happened, and he did not deny it. However, John's bad mood didn't only affect his family. His employees and even the company's clients suffered from the betrayed husband's outbursts of rage. Seeking to put distance between his wife and her lover, he decided to move the family to an exclusive area in Crown Point, Indiana. Despite still being in love with Judy and hoping that by removing her from temptation they could have a fresh start, things did not improve. While Judy began to improve her appearance by losing weight and changing her look, John let his beard grow, started smoking, his wardrobe was reduced to jeans, and he was constantly distracted. The business suffered as a result of his state, ending up almost bankrupt and having to sell his boat to stay afloat. Rumors circulated in the office that Judy was having an affair with Jeff, John's right-hand man. Though it was unclear if the rumors were true, they undoubtedly fueled more disagreements. At a certain point, Judy informed him that she had decided to divorce. But it wouldn't be that simple. John felt that he had given everything to his wife, pulled her out of poverty, accepted her children, showered her with luxuries, and above all, loved her to the point of idolatry. With that same passion turned into resentment, he began to cut off all his wife's sources of money. He made it clear that if she left, she would leave with nothing, 
and his secret weapon was the recording of her infidelity with the office employee. This was the scenario at the beginning of 2003, and of course, the tensions between the couple affected the children, whose behavior went from bad to worse. Even Tiffany spent the holidays grounded because she and a friend had started a fire on school grounds. The end of the arguments came on Thursday, April 17, 2003, when John and Judy went out to dinner alone at a restaurant, possibly trying to find a solution to their situation, or maybe just trying to tone down the confrontation. After dinner, they called home to check on the kids and announced they would return shortly. At that moment, Christina asked them to stop by the office because she had left a school notebook there. Leaving the restaurant, they headed to the company, and John took the opportunity to bring the leftover dinner to Jeff, who was supposedly working late. The couple arrived at the office in a deserted industrial area just before 10 p.m. Both entered the office while John talked to Jeff. Judy picked up her daughter's notebook and returned to the car parked outside. Minutes later, John came out of the office and opened the rear door on the driver's side to search for something in the vehicle, when suddenly two loud bangs were heard and John collapsed on the parking lot floor. Instantly, the 911 received calls from Judy and the other from Jeff. As routine in such cases, police and medical assistance units arrived at the scene within minutes. Unfortunately, John, 33 years old, had been shot in the back of the head and was declared dead on the scene. Upon interrogating Judy, who was inside the car at the time of the incident, the woman could practically contribute nothing. She stated she was sitting there when her husband came out of the office, opened the back door on the driver's side, and immediately heard two detonations. Judy recounted that her reaction to hearing the shots was to hide, protecting herself with the seat, and when she lifted her head, she only managed to glimpse what seemed to be a man in dark clothing running away from the car. John's wallet was missing, so at first glance, the incident seemed to have been a robbery. But the more the scene was analyzed, the more doubts arose in the investigators' minds. No one besides the couple knew they were going to be there, so a series of questions were formulated. Why would someone be looking to commit a random robbery in an industrial area that had no people in circulation at night? If it had been a robbery, why did they first take his life and only then stripped him of his wallet when in plain sight, John was wearing a $20,000 gold Rolex and other easily accessible jewelry? Why hadn't the thief searched the pockets as criminals usually do in these kinds of assaults? More questions than answers. Two bullet casings were found at the scene of the attack. This matched Judy's account of hearing two detonations. One of the shots ended John's life almost immediately, and as for the other, there was no official information. With their heads full of questions, the investigators began their work, and of course, the first person they took a statement from was Judy. She claimed that sometime before, her husband had had a heated argument with an employee of his company and identified the man. Beyond this, Judy could not provide anything more of interest beyond what she had said at the scene of the incident. Jeff was also not helpful. He was inside the office and when he came out upon hearing the detonations, everything was already over. Meanwhile, the authorities contacted the Parker residence and the call was answered by Christina, who was informed that her stepfather had passed away. With the robbery motive almost ruled out, detectives turned their focus towards John's circle, starting with the allegedly resentful employee. The man confirmed they had a significant argument but said it had been amicably resolved. Moreover, he had an alibi that was investigated and verified. The investigation then expanded to nearly everyone close to the young businessman business partners, past and current employees, competitors, and even John's friends and family. The only slightly suspicious finding was the interaction between the widow and the company's general manager, but there was no substantial evidence. Judy's demeanor during her husband's funeral was very intriguing. Comments mentioned Judy appearing cheerful and socializing with friends, in stark contrast to the expected mourning behavior. 
Her ex-husband, the father of her two children, was also noted to be comfortably reading a newspaper at the funeral. Four days after John's murder, Daniel, 15, was brought in for questioning on suspicion of involvement. This suspicion was based on an incident six months prior, where police were alerted by gang members that Daniel had paid them to kill his stepfather, John. Although they said they never intended to follow through and had merely kept the money, the police deemed the story implausible, confiscating the money and filing a report without apparent further action. However, given John's eventual murder, investigators revisited Daniel's potential involvement. Under interrogation, Daniel confessed to paying individuals to harm John, intending not to kill but to injure him, like breaking his legs. Despite detaining one of the youths Daniel allegedly negotiated with, he was released due to a solid alibi verified by the investigation. Daniel was released after nine days due to lack of substantial evidence and his minor status. Later, it was revealed that John had issues with Judy's children, leading to more investigation into Daniel and bringing to light suspicions about Judy's daughter, Christina, 17. Christina denied everything when questioned, and like before, the alleged plan led nowhere. Given that both teenagers had shown a desire to eliminate John, investigators wondered where the money for these schemes was coming from, suspecting Judy as the only possible source. Further inquiries revealed that the relationship between the couple had significantly deteriorated prior to John's death, with at least one of Judy's affairs coming to light. However, sources indicated that John had no intention of leaving his wife and was seeking ways to salvage the relationship. The primary motive for Judy to target her husband appeared to be financial, with detectives discovering John had two life insurance policies totaling $1 million. Judy had attempted to claim this money after her husband's death, but the insurance company initially refused to pay citing the ongoing investigation into his death. The payment was further complicated by John's father, who suspected Judy's involvement in his son's demise. Despite these leads, the case eventually stalled, with only circumstantial evidence available. Life moved on, but significant changes occurred within the Parker family household. Judy was hardly ever home, apparently busy with her new partner, Jeff, John's trusted manager. In her absence, the older siblings took care of their younger half-sisters, Tiffany and Erica. Months later, Judy and Jeff decided to move out of state with John's younger daughters, while Daniel went to live with his biological father. Christina remained in the house, now pregnant and with a boyfriend. Though the investigation had hit a dead end, authorities kept the case open regularly revisiting the files in hopes of finding something substantial. Their persistence paid off when, following a new lead, they interrogated some schoolmates of Christina and Daniel, who admitted to selling them a firearm. This information led detectives to investigate a piece of family-owned land used by Christina for shooting practice. Upon inspecting the area, investigators indeed found several bullet casings. These findings were analyzed in laboratories, and a significant clue was discovered. The bullet casings matched those from John's crime scene. In 2007, additional information emerged through a colleague, a narcotics officer who had been tracking Christina's ex-boyfriend, involved in a drug case and arrested. Seeking leniency in his case, the ex-boyfriend disclosed a conversation with Judy in which she mentioned that it was her son Daniel who had fired the shot that ended John's life. Confronted with this information, 21-year-old Christina, linked to the weapon used in the crime, quickly began to talk. She admitted to purchasing the weapon and calling her parents on the night of the incident, asking them to stop by the office under the pretense of picking up forgotten homework. She confessed to being part of a plan to kill John, with her brother Daniel designated as the shooter. When 19-year-old Daniel was located and detained in Arizona, he was presented with the new ballistics evidence 
and his sister's account. He readily admitted to being the one who shot John, but claimed that Judy, their mother, was the mastermind behind the plot. Daniel disclosed that Judy had forged company checks to gather the necessary funds to hire hitmen to kill John. The amount stolen was reportedly $7,500. However, when the initial plan fell through because the hired individuals took the money without completing the job, Judy allegedly instructed them to purchase the weapon for her son to use instead. Furthermore, Daniel revealed it was Judy's idea to create the pretext for leaving the house that night by making the call about the homework. He stated he shot John once in the head, and the second shot was an accidental discharge while he was rifling through John's pocket for his wallet, following his mother's instructions. He was also told to return home without alerting his younger sisters, a task facilitated by Christina, who kept the girls occupied with television. The siblings claimed their mother had convinced them to commit the crime by alleging they were victims of abuse by John and promising them a better life with more money and freedom. It was also revealed that this was not Judy's first attempt to kill her husband. She had previously tried to poison his food, leading only to a brief hospitalization for John under the guise of food poisoning. By the end of 2007, Christina and Daniel were formally charged with murder and conspiracy. Christina pleaded not guilty to the conspiracy charge and was released on bail several months later in March 2008. Daniel, then 20 years old, pleaded guilty to a conspiracy charge to kill his stepfather and made a deal to admit his guilt and implicate his mother in the crime. In exchange for his cooperation, the prosecution agreed not to charge him with the more serious offense of murder, although he would still face a sentence of 20 to 25 years in prison. Daniel claimed that nearly a year before the incident, when he was 14, his mother and sister first asked him to help kill John. He detailed that his mother gave him and his sister money to buy a pistol, as well as providing him with black clothing, gloves, and a mask to wear on the day of the crime. She also instructed him on what to do to carry out the grim task, including taking a thorough shower upon returning home to eliminate any traces of gunpowder. Ultimately, Judy took responsibility for disposing of the weapon, the clothes worn during the crime, and her husband's wallet. Facing the inevitable in July 2009, six years after her husband's death, Judy surrendered to the authorities and agreed to plead guilty to conspiracy to commit murder, acknowledging her role in planning, executing, and covering up the crime. The prosecution requested that she be sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 28 years and a maximum of 35 years. Judy, nearing 40, was sentenced to 33 years in prison in late August 2009. The following month, Daniel was sentenced to 23 years, and in early October, Christina, who eventually pleaded guilty to aiding a criminal, received a five-year sentence. Press reports indicate that Daniel was released in 2017 after participating in a community transition court program and chose to live a low-profile life thereafter. Christina served four years of her sentence and was released in 2013, but tragically, she died from a drug overdose shortly after her release. This case is marked by greed. Despite Judy's difficult early life and later success, her insatiable desire for more led her to commit heinous crimes. Sadly, her actions not only destroyed a successful entrepreneur, but also profoundly impacted her four children, leading two to prison and leaving the younger ones without their father and mother. Once again, dear audience, I thank you for your company. If you haven't subscribed yet, I warmly invite you to do so and become part of this great community. This is Unreal True Crime. Until our next episode, good night.